Welcome to YGTV and YG One on One, written by Flex Scripts. I'm your host, Paul M. Newberger, CEO and founder of the Young Guns Movement. On YG One on One, I bring CEOs, business leaders, and more to the set right here at Serendipity Labs to discuss who they are, what they do, and how they got there. YG One on One, written by Flex Scripts, is just one of four shows here on YGTV, our very own channel designed to help you grow and succeed in your career, business, and life. If you haven't yet, please click the subscribe button below so that you don't miss a single episode of YGTV. If you're on the go, you can also listen to the episode on the Young Guns podcast. My guest today is Katie Paling Seymour, CEO and President of First Supply LLC. Katie has an impressive background in a family-owned business that has defied all statistics on its path to sustained success. If you will, please join me in welcoming Katie here on YG One on One after this short break. If you're a CEO, listen up. Odds are you're paying too much for your employee benefit pharmacy spend. How do I know? I work with Flex Scripts. They're the PBM police, delivering their average client 15 to 20% savings on their pharmacy benefits. Think how much money that is. Flex Scripts makes sure your PBM keeps their promises and meets your guarantees. And if they don't, Flex Scripts holds them accountable and gets you what you deserve. Stop paying too much for your pharmacy benefits. Get Flex Scripts, the PBM police, on your side. Start the conversation today at FlexScripts.com. That's FlexScripts.com. For more than 80% of families, today's medical billing practices are confusing. At HPS, our goal is to improve the healthcare experience for the patient by making medical bill payments less stressful. In Wisconsin, that's all made possible by our comprehensive independent healthcare provider network. We simplify billing and lower costs for everyone involved in healthcare and offer various ways for individuals to pay without breaking the bank. Today's guest is Katie Paling Seymour, President and CEO of First Supply. Katie, wonderful to have you on the program today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, one of the first things that I noticed about you, and it took me about seven seconds to realize this, is you're just a person with a lot of passion in life. You exude passion. It's very contagious to say the least. Where does your passion for life come from? Gosh, it just, I guess, comes from um, being grateful for, for much of, of life and uh, having a glass half full attitude. Um, Honestly, it's, it's something that um, I was raised with a glass half full attitude and just trying our best every single day and putting it all out there makes us feel good at the end of the day that, that we've done that. Now, where does that, where does that come from? I mean, did you learn that from somebody? Were you just surrounded by optimists growing up in life? I mean, <laughs> where, where did you kind of get that, that outlook on life, would you say? I would say from my family. Um, I work in our family business today and our family is an, an extremely important part of what we do, both at home and at work. And I would say that I've had uh, the, I've been lucky to have great role models throughout my life. So, so talk about that a little bit. So, so growing up with a family that runs a family-owned business, I have to imagine you, you've kind of seen the best of both worlds. You've seen the, the personal side, but you've also seen the, the professional side, probably learned a couple of lessons along the way. What was it like growing up in an atmosphere like that? Yeah, so when a family business, it's, it's fantastic that you are able to balance both at home and at work. You don't necessarily turn off uh, your business mind when you get home, but it's not all about work all the time. There's definitely a balance to it. So, so what, what specifically did you learn 
from your father? What specifically did you learn from your grandparents? I mean, the people that have been associated with the First Supply organization during those formative years of your life, what did you witness, what did you learn, and how has that kind of made you the, the leader that you are today? I would say there's, there's something about making uh, sure that we're caring for the, we have a duty of care for our business, right? We have a duty of care for the people who work in our business. I, I mentioned to you earlier today in thinking about the pandemic, one of the things that I remember waking up one day and thinking, there are 700 families who are relying on the decisions I'm gonna make these next couple weeks to make sure that I do this right. That's an incredibly scary feeling, but it's also an incredibly inspirational feeling because you can, you can help people. You can make a difference in what you do every day. And if you're just doing your best and if you're really making sure that your decisions have at their heart the best interests of your employees, your customers, your vendors, and the families, You'll, you'll do pretty well. Yeah, I would agree with that. So well, let's go to one of those age old questions, especially now that you're in top leadership. And congratulations, by the way, on recently becoming CEO of your organization. As I alluded to earlier, you've got that new CEO smell, which is really kind of neat to see. Fresh out of the box kind of a thing. Exactly. Uh, so so you've been a leader for a while. You're, you're, you're no stranger uh, to uh, living life at the top. So you, you've heard that question before. Are good leaders born? or are good leaders made? Based on your experience, how would you answer that? Both. I think you've gotta be born with a desire to take the risk. It's not all easy. It's not all um, just to hand it to you no matter what you come into. Um, I think you've gotta have the innate desire to wanna put yourself out there. But at the same time, you've gotta have the uh, ability to learn and the ability to take feedback, the ability to realize that this is an ongoing process, an evolution in, in how you're going to present yourself every day and how you're going to put yourself out there every day. So I think it's, I think it's both. You, you can't just be born with it and you can't just learn it. You've gotta have a, a good mix of it. What, what, what keeps natural born leaders from realizing their full potential, would you say? Because the way that you kind of described it, I, I think there's a lot of people like that. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people that are naturally curious. There's a lot of people that are risk takers. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people that have a lot of self-confidence. And you would say, man, these people would be natural leaders for organizations, yet for whatever reason, they never realize their full potential. What, what, what keeps people that were born for roles like yours from getting to where they ultimately could be? I would say uh, a curiosity to learn, but to learn in a way that um, keeps, keeps driving you forward and that, that risk taking. Um, you know, you can be born to want to lead and you can be born curious, but you've also gotta have a, and, and my father as our CEO was probably, his appetite for risk was, was fantastic. And, and um, so he, he probably rolled the dice on some things that really paid off for us. There's that element of luck. There's an element of luck in every business. So maybe that's really truly the answer is that you're lucky, you're in the right place at the right time. Um, I shared with you a story before about our business and how we, we found some success early on and really what set us up in our financial stability was this old, uh, kind of folktale we have about during World War II, one of our salesmen was riding the train back to the Dakotas, because at that time salesmen rode trains, and uh, war was declared, so we added a zero to the end of our order, and that controlled the piping allocations for the rest of the war. And we were just lucky that we had a salesman that knew we were good for it. He knew we were, we, our appetite for risk was that we were gonna go for it. That was f for my grandfather. And all those little bits of luck add up, and having a, an ability to project that, that you're willing to do those kinds of things, I think that's a, a huge part about being a leader. Yeah, what's, what's amazing is First Supply, like you said, is fifth generation. Now, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, so for the fact checkers that are watching this, don't get mad if I butcher <laughs> the statistics, but I, I, I believe I read somewhere, saw something once, that 90% of family-owned businesses don't make it past the third generation. It's kind of like that yeah. third generation jinx. I mean, we can talk about you know, why that is, and I've got some theories, I'm sure you do too, but not only have you blown past three generations, you're at generation five and you're yep. going strong. What, 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 what has been First Supply's secret to success? How have you been able to defy the odds and put those numbers way back in the rearview mirror? I think, 
that old German stubbornness. <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, really. But um, I think no matter what, um, we are a family-led business, but there are 699 other people or so that um, also contribute to this business and that are really, really important to it. So while there's the Paling family that has, has been able to lead this business, we've really been able to surround ourselves with a phenomenal team and that that team contributing to keeping us uh, on our toes is really an important piece of, of what we do. I think that's what's helped us continue through generations. But I also think um, a true respect in our family for those who came before us. We talk about being stewards of our family's legacy and truly our family's asset. And that is something that, that I think helps transition between generations because it's, it's not a, a culture of personality. It doesn't really matter that I'm Katie and I'm the fifth generation. What matters is that I'm the steward of the rest of my family's uh, legacy and, and assets, and I need to be responsible with those. How do, how do you deal with the pressure that comes with that? Because I have to imagine you have an extra layer of pressure, perhaps, that some people just don't have. I mean, there's, a, there's always pressure at the top, for sure. CEOs, presidents, mm -hmm. I mean, we know that it's lonely. There's a lot of important decisions you have to make. That goes without saying, but your standing on the shoulders of the people that came before you. And it's not sure. just random nobodies, it's dad, it's grandpa, it's the mm -hmm. people that came before them. Like you said, the Paling family. Yeah. How do you deal with the extra pressure that that might cause? And, and what advice would you give to other top executives of family-owned businesses that might be in a similar situation? I, again, have had the luxury of true confidence in those who came before me. I've had something to learn from all of them. No one is perfect. They certainly were not perfect leaders. They were not perfect business men, all of them being men before me. But uh, I think a lot of it is just knowing that there's something to learn from them and having the confidence that I can put my own spin on it. Um, I am my own leader, I am my own person. I'm in a different environment than they were. I've got a different set of facts and circumstances. Heck, there was a pandemic while I, while I took on my leadership. So that was something that um, it was interesting. I did, um, my, one of my uncles is sort of our resident historian, and I asked him what happened in the pandemic of was it 1918 or, or so. And we didn't have a lot of records, but we did find we didn't lose any employees, which was really important to us um, and, and gave me a little bit of perspective. Again, some confidence. Someone in my family has been through this before, so how did they approach it? Even though maybe they didn't write down what they did every day and how they did it, I could think back to, okay, what might they have thought through? What might they have taken from that? So there's a lot of pressure, like you said, in, in being in the moment, but there's also a lot of, of confidence in knowing that four other generations of my family have done this. Hopefully four more do it after me too. Yeah, well, one of the things, and in, in we had this conversation previously, one of the things that is a hallmark of the Young Guns movement is authenticity and vulnerability. We're, we're, we're not this movement of entrepreneurs where we're standing in front of Rolls Royces and private planes and shooting the cash <laughs> cash money kind of a thing. I mean, that, those are some of the things that come with successful leadership for sure. And for those that like it, they can aspire to that. But we like to meet people where they're at and let them know that it's totally okay to be themselves. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with them. And one of the things that I'm, I'm sure you've experienced along the way are some pretty tough days. Mm -hmm. so, so some days maybe where you face challenges that could have been borderline insurmountable. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a moment like that? Maybe where along your career path or your, your career trajectory you thought, you know what, maybe I'm not cut out for this or you know, maybe I'm not going to make it. What, what, describe that situation and how were you able to overcome that doubt or that obstacle that you were faced with? So like everybody, I'm accountable to someone. I'm accountable to our board of directors. And um, there's, there's more than one occasion when I've been preparing for a board meeting, preparing to um, talk to our board of directors about something I believe strongly in, an action we should take, a decision we should make. And I'm not sure that they agree with me. And I have to have the, the courage of conviction to really convince them. Um, by education, I'm a, a lawyer, so some of that background helps me because I can, I can lean on, on some of that education that I've had. But at the same time, any argument is really baseless if you really don't believe in it. And so if there, sometimes there are things that I, I can think of an example or two where there's been something that I didn't necessarily believe in. And having to make sure that you say, you know what, that this might be a, 
okay business decision. This might be something we could do. But if I don't really think that I can carry the, the conviction forward to convince not only uh, a group of board of director, a group of directors on my board, but also the 699 other employees, it's probably not something we should do. It has to be something that we we can really truly get behind. Do you believe that enough top executives today in corporate America have that same belief in their convictions that that they? make unpopular decisions because they feel it's right or do you think more often than not leadership goes with the flow or tries to do what's in the best interest of their stakeholders maybe in compromising their convictions to some degree obviously i'm not asking you to name yeah. names but it's a breath of fresh air to hear somebody that stands on their conviction mm -hmm. so do you think enough leaders in corporate america do that today and if not what do you think one of the drivers of that would be one of the things that's good and bad is the amount of visibility that we have to leaders today. So in the news, if someone makes a decision that maybe was unpopular, but they really believed in, the, the cancel culture, right? It, it, can, it can really quickly spiral out of control. So I think that there's been, in some ways, companies pulling back a little bit because there's some fear that if you make the wrong decision, it could have lasting, significant consequences on social media, which leaders generations before us just didn't have. Um, we are, have the luxury of, of not necessarily having a stock price. I'm accountable to my family and as shareholders, I'm accountable to my board of directors, but that's not necessarily published in the newspaper every day. Um, that's a luxury. We have a luxury we're in here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We're not in New York City in a high profile environment um, that, that maybe has a different layer of pressure. So you can certainly rationalize any of it. <laughs> I can say that all of those things, but I do think that, that there's a shift in, in some ways in how leaders have that extra element of, of making sure that they're not going to put themselves out there too far sometimes. Well, you brought up cancel culture, and I wouldn't mind diving a little bit deeper into that. I mean, that, that is a real phenomenon, and that's mm -hmm. a, another layer of complexity that you have as a leader that maybe your father didn't have, your grandfather right. didn't have, especially with the advent of social media where everybody's watching your every move. I had a, a situation recently, but the pin I'm wearing is C-Suite for Christ, which is mm -hmm. another organization that I founded, and needless to say, talking about faith in a culture like today can also uh, make you a target from time to time. And there was an individual that was a member of my group who worked for a financial services organization. She posted about her beliefs on social media and she was reprimanded for doing that right before the organization disseminated stuff about uh, Pride Month and everything else and asked her to share that. And she thought, well, this is, this is weird. I mean, especially if certain aspects go against my religious beliefs. So as a leader, how, how do you navigate the two? Maybe what you stand for, what your culture is all about, if an employee wants to share something. I mean, how, how have you been able to navigate this in, in your time at the top of First Supply? You used a word earlier that I think is the, the cornerstone of it, is authenticity. Um, during the pandemic was a huge moment of vulnerability, also a word you used, to, um, for everybody. All of a sudden, we were doing meetings at home, and maybe a kid walked behind, maybe a dog was barking, and, and you kind of went to your, your coworker, I didn't know you had a dog, you've never talked about that before. And all of a sudden, the person we brought to work became also the person who was at home. And we learned a whole bunch of things about each other, whether that was about our beliefs, whether that was about our faith or our families or whatever it may be. And I think that that brought a different level of authenticity to people. And if, as a leader and as an organization, if we can create space for people to bring that authentic authentic person to work as much as they're able to, to leave it at home behind them, then I think that we create the right balance. It's not about what ideas the, the organization wants to put forward. There's certainly things that um, are tricky. Um, There's certainly things that some people want to further that maybe the rest of the organization doesn't necessarily believe in. One of the things that I had the opportunity to do during the pandemic was to send an email to our organization um, on, a, on a regular basis. I started out every couple days, I went to daily, then we peeled back again to every couple days, you know, as the pandemic waned. But um, 
I started including things about my daughters. I actually was pregnant during much of the pandemic and had twins five months ago, and I included some little stories about that. And the feedback I got from our teams was incredible. I didn't realize the impact of that vulnerability that could have on others. Just knowing that, hey, I'm a mom too. Hey, I'm a person too. I've got a little kid who says funny stuff and it drives me crazy. And, and some of that really changed the ability for me to be able to connect with people in a really positive way. And that was really cool. It was a way that I could bring some more authenticity and create space for others to bring that as well. Yeah, and I think what's become an evident for the people watching this are, are some of the unique things that make you different. Not necessarily better, worse, just different. You, 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 you've been able to successfully differentiate yourself as a person, an executive, and I think that's why you're having a lot of the success that you are. So we, we've learned a little bit about Katie's personal differentiation. Can you talk a little bit about what makes First Supply different? I know you have competition. Mm -hmm. There's similar organizations across planet Earth that do what you do to some degree. Yep. What is it that makes First Supply so different in the marketplace? A lot of it is what, what makes me different. We're a family business. Uh, we're an independent business. Many of our competitors are national wholesalers and distributors. We operate right here in the upper Midwest. We, our, our fabric is, is that of the upper Midwest. So when we have the ability to connect with our customers, we live in their communities. We're right here, their neighbors. And that is a differentiator for us and something we're really proud of. We've continued to grow and expand dramatically. But we've, we've maintained the ability to, to truly be a, a local business. And, and how would you describe your corporate culture? I know you've worked very hard to create a certain culture, like you said, I mean, nearly 700 employees and growing. Um, how would you describe your corporate culture to people that don't know First Supply too well? Uh, being a family business, is, I've mentioned it a couple times now, is, is really at the core of a lot of what we do. But uh, having the, the relationships with our customers, we are, customer-centric business. Our customers are are what we do. We're a distrib distribution company. We don't make things anymore. We used to. We don't make things anymore. So we rely on our vendors and our manufacturers to bring us the right products. We select making sure that we're partnering with the best vendors that possible, others that have the same type of goals and aspirations we do, and we bring them to our customers in the best way possible, adding value with our services, with our knowledge, and with our ability to provide the right product at the right time, at the right price. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's unique about your leadership position right now is, is you're a young female executive, mm -hmm. and I think you're in a area that predominantly speaking has been dominated by men. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the finest executives I know are women, so I'm not casting dispersions at all, but <laughs> you're in a rather unique space in that regard. Do you think about that often? Does that drive you? I mean, what, what are your thoughts about uh, being a young female executive at the pinnacle of your career in a situation like this? I absolutely think about it very often. Um, it's something where I, I find myself in a, in a room where I'm the only person who looks like me, who talks like me very often, most, most of the time. And I've actually had some really great opportunities within our industry um, to, to do something about it. So um, I realized, and a, f a few other females in our industry realized that, that they were the only women in those rooms, but surely there were other women who were the only ones in those rooms in conference rooms and meetings all over the country. So we came together and started an, an organization under the umbrella of our industry organization for, for females who, any female, no matter what your uh, role within your company, wasn't just about leadership, it was about everybody. And it's about creating a community of, of other women, uh, making sure that we're promoting and we're retaining and we're attracting strong women to our, our industry. We realized that if we weren't able to attract women into our industry, we were really only ever going to speak to half the population, and that's not sustainable. And so it was truly becomes imperative for the, the survival of our industry that we're a more welcoming place where people can create great careers, no matter the level of organization that, in, in the organization, excuse me, that they're at. So that, that's certainly something I, I feel pretty strongly about, and not because we need to have um, a, a strong, hold a strong line around diversity. It's not, you know, 50-50. It's not just because there's two roles open, one has to be filled by a woman. They need to be filled by the best candidate. But if we're truly open to exploring who the best candidates are, then we're not... Uh, 
discounting any portion of the population as well. Yeah, well, you hit on one of the buzzwords that I was going to ask next. Like, you can see my notes here or something. It's crazy. <laughs> but, but one of the words that you hit was uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. So you hear three words a lot in business sectors today, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you specifically, and what is First Supply doing about that with how you run your organization on a day-to-day -day basis? I believe it's really important not to have diversity, inclusion, all those equity for the sake of those things, but to truly mean it and to truly build an organization and a culture where those things are built in. It needs to start at the bottom. We can't just say we're going to hire a whole bunch of diverse executives and, and check the box and we're done. We need to make sure that we've got the ability for groups of people to enter our organization and continue to develop and grow and find success within the organization. Do you think it helps or hurts the cause of diversity, equity, and inclusion when you have individuals or organizations that might say, well, 75% of the executives are men, 25% of the executives are women, we just need to put more women in positions? Or 80% of executives are white, 20% are black, we need to put more black people in executive leadership positions. Does a mentality like that help or hurt the cause if people are trying to check boxes just to be more diverse structurally? I have to be a little careful of this because my husband is a sociologist and it, it actually gives me phenomenal perspective because he thinks about these things totally different than any business person is ever going to think about them. But I think there's there's no wrong way to pursue the noble ideas of, ideals of having a more diverse and inclusive workplace. If Every, and every organization has to go about it in the best way they know how and what works for their organization. So if, it, if their executives feel that the best way is to have allocations or quotas or whatever it may be, that might be the only way that they can truly further those, those objectives. If others feel like those types of quotas and objectives really aren't going to further their cause, then that's probably not the right way for them to go about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I truly think that as long as we have the right um, if we're doing it for the right reasons, then there's really no wrong way to, do, to go about it. So you're going to have to let me know what your husband said of that answer once he reviews the tape now. <laughs> I know, I will. <laughs> it, it, it really is. It's, it's fascinating. It's been, especially in, in these moments, you know, following the pandemic, there, there was so much discussion in, in our country around these types of concepts. And to have him just at home to be able to say, what, are, what does this mean? Tell me more about this. Tell me how to think about this. Tell me what I should be thinking about and how I should be worried about it. When I think about being a, a well-rounded well leader, he's certainly a, a key part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what, what would you say is one of the things that keeps you up at night? Uh, I, I would say is most executives, the, the anxiety is there to some degree. The worry is there to some degree. The pressures we talked about is kind of an ever-present companion from time to time. What are some of the things specifically that if anything else would rob you of your rest would be what? I think um, in our industry right now, we've had, uh, we've ha we've had a boom. I mean, we're in the, the construction industry, we're, we're in that space. Um, I think, when, when is that gonna stop? That certainly, are we, are we really growing or are we just riding a wave? My leadership team's gonna laugh because I use the, riding the wave of, of you know, this positive environment right now. But sustainability is something, it's, it's sustainability and growth um, and what we're doing and how we continue to do it is, is something that really keeps me up at night. I already mentioned, I mean, there are 700 families that rely on the decisions that, that I make as a leader and that our leadership team makes. And that's probably the one thing that, that I think about. And I, I think about every single one of those people. It really doesn't matter, again, at what level of our organization they're at. They're an important contributor to what we do. We couldn't do what we do every day without any single one of those people. And so making sure that we're providing the right growth to continue to support all of them and to continue to innovate and revolutionize what we're doing. Um, if we just sit back and keep doing what, what five generations of my family's, four generations of my family's been doing, it'll last for a while, but it won't take us five generations forward. Yeah, well, one of the things that I get asked a lot as a speaker, as a trainer, as an entrepreneur is, is really what, what separates the people that are successful from those that aren't. And one of the things that I've been able to diagnose in my limited time on earth is it's not always the most talented people that are the most successful. It's not the most charismatic people. It's not the smartest people necessarily. But when you look at the, the really successful entrepreneurs and executives in the world, I believe one thing they have in common is they just did not 
give up. They kept going. Mm -hmm. and, and you never know how close you are to your breakthrough. You're, you're never closer to your breakthrough than you are right now. And when somebody stops, I give up, I can't do it. You might have just been on the precipice of busting through that wall. Mm -hmm. So based on what but your experience and based on the things that, that you've seen, what do you think is the ultimate ingredient to success? What, what do you think is that one or two things that really separates the successful people from those people that just never quite get to where they want to go? The, a lot of the things we've talked about, right? You, um, as you as you mentioned, um, that ability to keep going, it's actually the number one lesson I took away from the pandemic, both from a business person and, and personally, is for whatever reason, as we, we got up every day and, and we assessed the situation and what was in front of us, we never closed our operations. We continued to find ways. We were lucky, we were considered essential. So again, that luck was a big part of it. But at the same time, we, we didn't allow the fear of the unknown to, to just stop us. We kept just even a little bit. You, some, there were a few days where we had to really keep our doors closed and we had to batten down the hatches a bit and say, we've, we've got to keep <laughs> protect ourselves and we're not sure what that looks like tomorrow, let alone this afternoon. Um, but we kept going. We kept servicing our customers. We kept allowing them to place orders with us. We kept ordering from our vendors. And kind of partway through, I sat back and went, wow, we just kept rolling. We just kept going. And now that is serving us so well. So that ability to just not stop, just that, that never letting that flywheel get too slow um, and just letting it keep moving, I think is, is really the ingredient of success. I mean, so many leaders, so many uh, notorious leaders, I guess I'll say, sometimes that word's not good, but so many notorious leaders are ones that, that are high energy, you know, they're known for not sleeping, not, you know, just constantly on the go. And I think there's something to be said about that, um, that the constant, constant movement, constantly keeping things going. Yeah, I want to dig a little bit further on that because it, it, it sounds good to say just keep moving, or as my kids would say from Dory from Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, <laughs> yeah. I suppose just keep <laughs> yeah. swimming. Uh, you're where you are today because you just kept moving. But I know you're, you're a human being. You've had your days of doubt. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd be lying to yourself and the rest of us if you said you never did. Sure. So how personally have you been able to keep going on those days where you thought you weren't good enough, on the days you thought maybe I'm not cut out for this, on the days you thought, well, you know, maybe this, isn't, is, this just isn't my cup of tea. For the people that are watching this today that might be in a similar season of doubt, yep. how have you been able to keep going when that little voice in your head says, you're not good enough for this? I think two, two things if I think about it is one is just taking the moment to kind of wallow in your sorrows <laughs> and just saying, you know, this, this sucks right now. I really don't like what's going on. I, I feel like I'm not doing this right. This is just really hard right now. And just finding the, the time and space for yourself to acknowledge that is, is hugely, can be hugely um, healing right in so many ways and then figuring out how to fix it it's, i get sometimes one of my um blind spots is my rush to find a solution for things and I, I need to recognize that not everything needs a solution not everything needs to be fixed but that that's my natural tendency and in times i think where you're wallowing in your sorrows that serves me very well because my next thought is okay so what are we going to do about it and using my tools and resources whether it's my network or or others whether it's relying on a coaching relationship I have or a mentor or just reading a book about something, just researching something. Uh, how, how am I going to get myself out of that? Well, one of the things that's very apparent in just listening to you chat is, is I think one of the intangibles that you have is humility. You've said the word luck. I think good thing we're not playing like a drinking game with this water here. I'd yeah, be pretty full of water with all the times you said luck. I admire you, your humility to some degree. But one of my favorite sayings comes from Benjamin Franklin, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So don't you think part of the reason that you personally and First Supply professionally have had so much luck is because you guys have put yourself in a position to get these lucky breaks or am I looking at this incorrectly? No, I would, I would agree with you. I think that um, you can 
you can outwork the competition for sure. Um, and then, yeah, does that luck put you in the right place at the right time? Um, or does the hard work put you at the right place in the right time? Who knows? You know, mm -hmm. it's probably a flip of the coin sometimes. It's some, some days it's the luck, some days it's the hard work, but you need a, a combination of the two. So as we're getting ready to sign off here, if, if you were to leave the audience with a closing thought, whatever it would be, based on you know, personal matters, professional matters, anything that you think uh, would, would give them something to mull over to potentially be the best possible version of themselves, what would that closing thought be and why? I think my closing thought in terms of people really taking something away is, I'm going back to some of the things we've talked about, is finding the space and the ability to bring your authentic self to what you do. So if you haven't found a, a group of friends, if you haven't found um, a career that allows you to do those things, keep looking, keep thinking about making sure that you're putting yourself in a place where you can be the, the best version of yourself. And that will truly allow you to, that, that terrible old saying in some ways, you, if, you're, if you love what you do, you're never working a day in your life. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, darn it, that's right. <laughs> so <laughs> if, you can, if you can find a way to, to um, put yourself in that space, um, I, I think that, that that will be the, the biggest thing that, that people can do. Yeah, well, just to go back to that word once again, luck. I consider myself lucky to have had this conversation with you today. The Young Guns Movement is lucky to benefit from your influence, and the employees at First Supply are lucky to learn under your leadership. So, Katie, thank you for being here. We learned a lot, and we appreciate you sharing your words of wisdom with us. Thank you. What an incredible conversation we had with Katie right here at Serendipity Labs on YG One on One, written by Flex Scripts and sponsored by Health Payment Systems. It's been a delight to have Katie on the show, and now I've got a question for you, actually. Who do you want to see on this very program? YG One on One is about bringing together free thinkers and luminaries who can help educate and inspire you to think unconventionally and break the rules of business. Drop your suggestion in the comments below or on any of the Young Guns social media channels. Speaking of social media, just a friendly reminder to kindly follow the Young Guns movement on Facebook, LinkedIn, and right here on YouTube. We also distribute our shows as podcasts, so go ahead and give us a listen during your commute, workday, or wherever you so choose. Thanks again to Katie Paling Seymour, CEO and President of First Supply LLC, for sitting down with us here today on YG One on One. I'm Paul M. Newberger. We'll see you next time.